production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Senator Bob Corker, tonight on Behind the Headlines. Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by Bob Corker, U.S. Senator. Thank you for being here. Yeah, good to be with you, Eric. You Along. and Bill both. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Also, Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. Well, again, thank you very much for being here. Um, I guess where we are, we're, we're actually taping this on Tuesday, I should say, right. so this will air on Friday. But we're, give or take, you know, 90, 100 days into Trump's presidency. Yeah. And yeah. it's, you know, he's an un unconventional candidate, an mm -hmm. unconventional uh, President, your your thoughts on this first hundred days and, and what's been unexpected? Yeah, um, your thoughts. So uh, uh, I saw him yesterday briefly, and um, what I would the administration is evolving a great deal. I mean, you had a candidate who, you know, was at rallies and really didn't have a lot of institutional support, if you will, and and developed a lot of his positions based on responses, you know, uh, during that period of time. And now he's come into office and he's having to deal with the world as it is with all the complexities. And from a foreign policy standpoint, where you know I'm chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, so that's obviously a major focus, um, I've seen him evolve in a very positive way. I, I was somewhat concerned about uh, some of the campaign statements relative to foreign policy, but uh, on every front, I've seen him evolve to a very, very much more positive uh, place on uh, all around the world. So um, I, I actually have been gratified by that. He's uh, got a really crack, uh, great national security team around him. And they've been a little slow putting personnel in place, um, let's face it, and have gone through it. It's not like he came there with this host of people, you know, right. that he had served with as a governor or senator or something like that. Right. So. You know, uh, but I, I, again, on the foreign policy front, I'd, I'd say I'm very, very pleased with how they've evolved. And we'll dive into some of that foreign policy, okay. those issues. But again, just reflecting a little on his presidency, he's, he's even starting to get a little criticism, you know, yeah. that he's moderating because his, his, he had a very, very conservative, very right wing in many positions, you know, anti-NATO and, yeah. you know, we're going to get disengaged yeah. from the world. So, you know, is that just part of the process? You've been a senator for, what, now 10 plus years, give or yeah. take? yeah. Is it part of the process that Washington does moderate? I mean, that it does kind of, and, and even almost limit on how extreme a view you can have left or right? Yeah. No, I, I think, look, if I were to run for the, that big office, if you will, I kind of, I know exactly where I stand, right? I mean, I've been around these issues for years and, yeah. you know, ask me a question, I'll answer it. And, right. you know, usually it's based on, you know, a decade of, of understanding national issues. I think that uh, with the president, uh, you know, again, it was just an evolution that was taking place, and I don't think it's moderating him. As a matter of fact, having spent some time with him as potential Secretary of State or potential mm -hmm. VP person, I, I knew from day one he was right. not, if you will, a, a right-wing person in right. any way. So, but I think what's happening is he's he's. Uh, He's having people come in to see him from other parts of the world. He's beginning to understand these issues are much more complex than a soundbite or something said at a rally. And uh, I think that's a good thing. I mean, he's developing uh, uh, a depth of knowledge that uh, wasn't there, obviously, before he was elected. Before we go to Bill, did you, how seriously did you consider uh, going into the administration? The vice presidential thing, I very quickly shared with them that I didn't think it was the right role for me. I mean, just early on in the day of, I spent an entire day with them, but early on in that day, as was yeah. publicly documented, sure. I just didn't feel like it was the right thing for me, for them, for me to do it either. Um, Secretary of State, you know, that was interesting. I mean, I've, I've spent time in foreign policy and have traveled the world extensively and, you know, just came from Uganda there on some refugee issues. And so... That was interesting, but at the same time, I had a role uh, in the Senate as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee that was also. So in that particular case, uh, had I been asked, that would have been something that would have yeah. strongly considered and, and done, okay? Uh, but I think the Tillerson nomination, 
was really for him pretty inspired. I mean, here's a guy that's, you know, had a company all around the world. The president respects, you know, big companies right. and business right. like that. And I think, you know, allowed him to come in in a, in a very good way. Rex and I have a great relationship and I think all's worked well. Okay. Bill. Um, Senator, where do you think our foreign policy is on Syria in the wake of, of the administration's strikes in Syria in, yeah. in retaliation for the gassing of the town? Has it changed our foreign policy? In that well, I think, I think for the, uh, I talked to the president that night. Um, he had just uh, left the, uh, the leader of China and, and, you know, the strikes had occurred just momentarily before. I think it was some ways uh, transformative for him. I think when he saw the the gassing of people there and its effect, I think these things when you're or when you're sometimes when you're running. I've been to these refugee camps, Bill, and I know these many of the Syrians. They call me, believe it or not, from the from the conflict areas. They come visit me in the offices. Uh, so you know, I had a, if you will, a visceral. I had a real uh, tie to what was happening there. I know Assad. I, I met him before the conflict began. I think for the president, it tied, it made a personal connection to what was happening there. And in some ways, I do think it uh, quickly he realized what it meant to be the president of the United States and commander in chief on issues like that. So in many ways, yes, I do think it affected his foreign policy. I thought the response that we gave was exactly right. It was surgical. It was, you know, tied to what had occurred. It was at the airport where the, you know, the, the chemical weapons had taken off and where they had been stored. So I thought he did exactly the right thing. I think people built, built people, you know, there's actually two, a minimum of two things going on in Syria. There's the Assad regime and what he's doing to his own people uh, in the western part of the country mostly. And then you've got what's happening with ISIS and Raqqa and other areas and then all the various groups that are on one side or another. So there's actually two different things in many ways that are happening there. But I thought, uh, I thought his response to what Assad did was perfectly appropriate and right thing to do. So then the, the, does our response on that, should it change our policy to refugees? Should it change our, our, our outlook on the travel ban or the administration's outlook on the travel ban, have, having, having seen this problem that can cause people to yeah. flee from an area like that? Yeah, I think, you know, where we, Bill, where we blew it in Syria was we had, you know, great... Um, conversations that were taking place between Turkey and us to create a, a no-fly zone along the border and uh, and also to deal with flights over the northwest triangle uh, of, of Aleppo and there was an opportunity at that time to keep refugees from flooding into Europe by creating a place for them to stay within their, within their own country and our former president just never could, you know, get to that decision process. And I'm not sure that Turkey wasn't continuing to move the bar. I can't speak to what was happening there. But, but uh, I think that the real solution to Syria, refugee-wise, would have been to figure out a way for them to be able to stay within their own country. But when we would not step up with others to help make that happen, it created uh, a flight out of the country as it relates to the, the travel ban, it's my hope that, you know, they'll go through this in a very speedy way. They'll, they'll realize that uh, they'll put things in place to make sure that Americans feel safe about what's happening and, and we can move on and, and, uh, and normalize our policies. So it, is it possible, in your view, for us to work for the elimination or neutralization of ISIS and also work toward a day when Assad is not in power and a day soon when Assad is not in power. Can those two be pursued at the same time? They can. Uh, I mean, in fairness, I, uh, there was an interesting Tom Friedman editorial just in the last few days uh, that I read. Um, you know, the fact is that we're actually helping Assad in some ways uh, by trying to rid Raqqa of ISIS and other parts of Syria at the same time the reason we're doing that is because they're a threat to us. I mean, this is where many of the, the, the efforts against Western civilization, against our allies in Europe and us, that's where they're planned, is out of Raqqa. So um, you end up in these complex situations. So the answer is yes, you can try to deal with ISIS uh, to, in, a, in a way. For Assad, it benefits him because, you know, we're dealing with one of the problems within the country. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, yes, I think we can work with the world community to 
try to rid the country over time of Assad, who's lost his legitimacy. Um, my hope is he's going to end up behind bars. I mean, this guy's a, a, a war criminal. There's no question. There's no doubt in my mind he's a war criminal. Yeah, he's tortured people. I don't know if you've seen the Holocaust Museum exhibit of Caesar, who's gone in and photographed the torture of his own people. Uh, it, it's, it's beyond belief that in 2017 this is happening. And uh, again, I, I, I hope we're able to work with others in a constructive way to, to move him on out. Do you worry, you know, we look back at, I mean, no one, I don't, no one at this table, and I don't think many, many people in the United States would, would defend Assad, but do you look back at Afghanistan, at Iraq, at, at Libya, and the destabilizing of, of dictators, yeah. however horrendous they are, yeah. they then destabilize that country, and, and the, the, what comes next, we haven't really mastered. And it, yeah, then back no to, question. it is driven, yeah. this refugee crisis is in part driven all kinds of terrorism. It's driven in part the, ref, the, the immigration ban. So when you say removing Assad, do you worry about what, what that next step could be? Yeah, I, you said remove Assad. I said, you know, work for a future. Fair, fair, towards, yes, fair uh, enough. Towards, yeah, please. So look, yeah, I mean, for that very reason, I thought what we did in Libya was actually uh, one of the, you know, what we didn't do in Syria in 2013, from my standpoint, public service-wise, right. was the lowest moment of my right. career right. when we had an opportunity. The moderate rebels actually had momentum yeah. uh, near Damascus. Uh, things were moving, and these were people who, you know, were really moderate people who just yeah. wanted a country like ours, if you will. When we didn't take those actions, and since 500,000 people are dead, half the country displaced, uh, that was a low moment. But let me go back to the to Libya issue. Um, I, I thought that was a terrible mistake on our part. I couldn't, it was, you know, here we have a guy, Gaddafi, uh, who's a terrible person, who had rid his country of, uh, of weapons of mass destru uh, destruction. So we killed him. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, what kind of signal has that sent the leader of sure. North Korea? I mean, right. the leader Absolutely. of North Korea is basically saying, if I, you know, if I can have nuclear weapons, I'm going to die an old man in my bed, unlike what happened to Gaddafi, right? right? So, so, no, it was a terrible thing for us to do. In Iraq, uh, no doubt we went in with, uh, we had no plan and thought we were going to turn this country into a mirror of the uh, United States. And, I mean, I've been there I don't know how many times. I'm just telling you, Iraq is not... Right. Uh, going to be governed exactly like the United States. So, no, we've made a lot of mistakes. And therefore, with Assad, no, it can't be just going in and crumbling the regime. I mean, the fact is the Alawite population, which is about 10 percent of the people who used to live there, it's even greater now, right? But they're the folks that are the, they're the more secular oriented, I might add, but they're the, and they protect Christians. Um, we need that institutional uh, a group of people to be there in the country, but Assad himself as a leader, uh, it's my hope, will try him for war crimes and, and right. uh, you know, put him in jail. The, just briefly, I mean, there, were, there was talk, an un, you know, sourced article about uh, the Trump administration talking about putting more troops, tens of thousands of U.S. troops into Syria. Are, are you aware of that? Are you interested? I mean, are you in favor of more no. troops going in? No. Okay. I mean, I, yeah. not at all. I yeah. think, you know, there are some additional special operators that have gone in. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's amazing to see what these guys are able to do as far as directing drone attacks and those right. kinds of things. But as far as infantry the, on the, the ground, nobody, nothing I don't know of anybody that's interested in that. There might be a couple of senators. Right, right. a couple yeah. of senators. Uh, you, see, you mentioned North Korea, and I should say again, because it's a pretty quickly moving situation. Mm -hmm. it's, we're taping this on Tuesday. It will air on Friday. Your thoughts on where, what next with North Korea? The, yeah. the tension is building, um, a lot of pressure, different kind of talk from, from the Trump administration than the previous administration, yeah. and yet no administration, Republican or Democratic, has, has, has figured this one out. No. What do you think the direction no, should be? No, I mean, be? The, the failure of dealing with North Korea is Bush 41, Clinton, Bush 43, Obama, right. and now, you know, we're, now they're on the brink of getting, they're really you know, in another couple of years, it's beyond return, right? right. I mean, they're going to have the ability to deliver an ICBM on the continental United States. Um, you know, open source reporting would say that they've got 20 to 30 uh, warheads now. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's got to be dealt with. And uh, China is, I mean, this is almost a cliche to say everyone knows this, but China is the most important partner. I think the president and, the, and their leader had a very good meeting and beginning relationship building. And I think hyping, uh, be, you know, turning the volume up right now is an important thing to do with the acknowledgement that uh, 
what you could bring in is Russia, China, South Korea, Japan into yeah. a conflict. So you got to be careful as to how you do that. But I think, you know, this is an issue that we've got to go ahead and address. Otherwise, you're going to be beyond right. a return. Right. Bring it back home a little bit. Um, uh, we talked about immigration and the, and the travel ban. When the first ban went in and then it was rescinded, a second one yeah. out there, all this pressure on immigrants and, and yeah. travel. Did yeah. you hear from companies in Tennessee? I mean, from FedEx to, to, to Nissan, did, you know, the universities. I mean, there was some talk of people being yeah. stranded, there um, were, the impact on students and employees yeah. and so on. Did you yeah, hear? I don't know if you remember, but I sent out a very terse response within 20 minutes heard from the White House. Um, uh, but no, it was just poorly crafted. I mean, people with green cards were in the air. Uh, when they landed, I mean, right. they had no idea. You know, the position changed, I think, three times over the weekend right. as far as what, you know, right. authorized holders of right. the ability to be here in, in, in our country were able to do. So um, so they, they, they got that more right. They dropped Iraq. I was in Iraq uh, about the time they were crafting it, just about a month or five weeks ago, and and communicated with them. Look, you know, here we are fighting side by side, and right. we're basically saying, and yeah, I mean, these guys have, been... have risked their lives, and you know, this right. is not, this is just not appropriate. So I think they find to it. Here's what I hope, and I think everyone hopes, is that they're going to go through this process of understanding the vetting, how it works get to a place where we feel like we have all the, the right. appropriate steps in place, and then we're going to normalize our policy. Well, let's segue a little bit with, with immigration to uh, illegal immigration from Mexico and South America, and that's been obviously the wall, and I don't really particularly need to talk about the yeah. wall per se, but, but the, in terms of, I mean, you were mayor, mayor of Chattanooga. Um, mayors across the country feeling, cities across the country starting to feel a lot of pressure from the administration in terms of whatever a sanctuary city means and, yeah. and not enforcing immigration custom yeah. um, uh, actions. Yeah. I think Mayor Strickland's been on this show and talked yeah. about how, look, we're not in the business. Our, the Memphis Police Department is not yeah. in the business of, of, of breaking down doors and rounding up illegal immigrants. I don't, you don't have to comment on yeah. Memphis policy. Yeah. But your take on what the appro what, what should cities be doing? I mean, what, how should cities work with the federal government with, with undocumented or illegal immigrants? Yeah, look, I, I, on one hand, you're right. I mean, I used to be a mayor, and your local police department is not the customs service or the you know, immigration service, uh, and, you know, you don't want that to be the case. You don't want to nationalize what's happening at the local level. On the other hand, there, there are cities that actually uh, advertise, you know, and, and try to create a situation where they lure people. That's inappropriate, and so I think there's a, there's a I mean, I do think that when that is taking place, when there's an obvious obfuscation, if you will, of our U.S. immigration policy, then that's got to be dealt with in, in the appropriate way. Okay. Bill. Um, so t talking about something like the rollout of the travel ban and, and things that went wrong with it, um, it, was that a function of a new administration finding its legs or do, do we have something deeper going on, a, a fight for views within the administration yeah. of, of uh, competing ideologies in the White House? Because I wasn't sitting in that meeting, okay, but, uh, or the meetings that took place leading up to that. My sense is it was a rush to, you know, get something out there that was, you know, stated was going to be dealt with during the campaign without crossing all T's and dotting all I's. And, I think it was probably the, the, the first part of your question. It was, uh, you know, they're new, they're wanting to have impact. Um, I think, again, the longer they're there, the more is realized that, hey, these issues, healthcare, for instance, are a lot more difficult than we ever thought. But I think it's the first. I don't think it was a, uh, I know there have been some competing mm -hmm. views on things, but I, I, would, I would rack it up to the first point. So, uh when we were in the primary season, you, you, you and Senator Alexander talked talked a good deal about this at, at a time when Trump was not the nominee apparent. Right. And, and your point at that time was, if if he gets the most votes, how do you deny him the nomination? Right. How do you how do you go uh, uh, against that? And he wound up being the nominee. So, right. when you're president, though, it seems as if once you win the election. That all changes and doesn't doesn't count for a whole lot like it did when you're going for the nomination. Yeah. Um, do, do you think that Trump has been accepted given the closeness of the general election, the popular 
vote in it. Oh, well, look, I, you know, I just came from a town hall meeting, and I can assure you that not the entire country um, has accepted. And, you know, there, you know, there's a lot of division. I mean, you think about, you know, the country was on a trajectory under President Obama, and people on the Democratic side thought that Secretary Clinton would continue that trajectory, and all of a sudden, trajectories in the in a very different direction in many ways. Um, so, uh, no, I mean, I think the country, uh, you know, just the type of campaign that took place, I mean, it really, if you look at the Western world in general, I mean, we're seeing this happen, you know, all around the world right now. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not just happening here in our own nation. And what you see is a population of people who, generally speaking, feel very insecure about their futures. I mean, you think about what's happening with technology. Uh, you know, you look at uh, people who, you know, maybe 55 years old, I'm just making up, a, a, who've worked hard all their life, maybe they didn't get the highest education level, but they've done all the right things, and they're looking at their future as being different than, than they ever thought. And then you've got a, a group of people who have a, uh, uh, you know, a whole different set of concerns. So, so right now, no, the country continues to be, uh, there's no question, uh, divided and uh, just the nature of the election itself, I think, uh, uh, helped make that occur. Now, you know, it's his job, regardless of that, he's President of the United States, um, it's his job to, to, to understand that and figure out a way to bring people together because we've got some huge issues that need to be solved. When, during the campaign, I mean, Trump won in no small part because of Rust Belt, uh, you know, the, exactly what you described, that insecurity yeah. and people feeling like, hey, I've been left behind in this new so. economy. And the you know the death of manufacturing jobs there. Right. Uh, a lot of people talk about it, not so much that they went to to Mexico, but automation and just yeah. changes in yeah. the economy. But a lot of those right. jobs came to the South. I mean, if you talk yeah. about automakers and go back to Volkswagen when you were, I mean, I think that started when you were. I can get my timing wrong, but you were very involved in getting the Volkswagen plant into Chattanooga. Yeah. Is is some of this just? I mean, no one would want to say this to an individual, the 55 year old person you described. But as a whole, is it just a matter of the economy shifts, jobs move? technology changes and they're just painful choices that people have to make? Yeah. Look, a big part of it is that. I mean, it's, it's the way our society is changing. And um, at the same time, I will say, uh, there are some things in these trade agreements that you know, need to be altered. And the interesting thing is, in spite of all the rhetoric, the president of Mexico understands that, is more than willing to, to make some changes. Um, we have uh, some other ones that need to be looked at. But, but short of throwing them out the door and, and starting yeah, from scratch. Yeah, I mean, no, that, I, mean so. I think you've already seen that, you know, the statements that are being made, it's going to be tweaked. It's not going to be thrown out. Right. Uh, there's a whole supply chain that's been built up around that that benefits uh, Tennessee, right? It, I mean, it really Memphis, does. Yeah. Memphis. I mean, yeah, you know, no FedEx, question. absolutely. No question. So, so I, I think that, though, we, we have, again, the Western world, and I'm going to include Europe and us and uh, collectively, I mean, there is a, we have a challenge uh, that people, I think, less or so feel the opportunity to, to uh, achieve and aspire to be what they thought they were going to be uh, earlier in life, and it's something right. that we got to deal with as a society. Some of that comes from, uh, and we could do 26 minutes, we have two, three minutes left, um, some of that comes from health care. And, and yeah. Trump ran on, and many, many Republicans ran on, repealing, replacing, getting rid of Obamacare, in the House at least, that, that, that died pretty publicly. Is, is, health, is, is, is reform or replacement of Obamacare dead for this year, does it seem? I don't think it's dead. Um, I, I don't think it's dead. I, I, I sense there's you know some movement on the House side. They wanted to start first. Uh, the Senate was going to make changes, okay? I mean, right. Different sensibilities uh, on the Senate side than on the House side in some cases. And senators, has a little, senators have a little bit more ability to singularly express themselves just because of the smaller numbers of people. But uh, Look, I, 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 I hope we will deal with it. I think, you know, Lamar and I have offered a piece of legislation that will grant Tennesseans who don't have a choice, there's no plan for them to go into, the ability to use that same subsidy or tax credit to buy plans that right. are off the exchange just as a stopgap measure. 
But uh, look, it's uh, it's got to be dealt with appropriately, and we've got to make sure that people have opportunities, right. real opportunities, to purchase health care that is useful to them. But do you hear? I mean, is 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 it just an accepted fact that Obamacare is the foundation, is the law of the land, and it's really going to be about tweaking now, about additional things versus a complete complete uh, repeal of it yeah. and a whole new system being put? Yeah, in place? I think you know. Look, I think, I think the words just that the people are using. Yeah, the, the words that people are using are replace or reform or. You know, and it deals with three things, really. I mean, it deals with, uh, you know, uh, making sure that the 10 essential health benefits are altered to give people flexibility so that Washington is not telling you the kind of policy uh, right. that you can buy. But um, it, so that's a big factor and really would affect people in a big way. It's about giving states the ability to, to really do Medicaid in a more flexible right. way. I know our governor would love to see that happen. Governors all across our country yeah. would. And making sure that these tax credits or subsidies are actually appropriately done so that people, especially lower right. income citizens, really have the opportunity to buy health care. With just a few, uh, you know, 30 seconds left, do you want to make any news today? You mentioned the governor. The governor is termed out. People have talked about you yeah. uh, being interested yeah. in that job. Are you interested in running for Tennessee governor? I'm not really interested in making any news. You know, I, I'm uh, <laughs> here enough. in the state to, uh, to travel. It's a huge honor. I think I told you I'd been in Uganda and seen uh, just the devastation there just a few days ago. 270,000 people in a refugee camp. We have a lot of issues here in our state and in our country. It's still the greatest country on earth, Tennessee, with the greatest citizens, and thank you for letting me be here. All right. Well, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week.